So I wish to welcome everybody on this retreat. And uh, this is our opportunity to contemplate our lives, understanding our humanity a little better, following the teachings of the Lord Buddha. And these eight precepts, which, well, first of all, I gave the refuges in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, which is uh, a part of this tradition to take refuge in Buddha, which is really taking refuge in awareness, mindfulness, because Buddha is a symbol for awareness, conscious awareness here and now, taking refuge in awareness, taking refuge in Dhamma, ultimate reality, absolute reality, and taking refuge in Sangha, those who practice in the proper way to realize this ultimate reality. So our real refuge is in Dhamma, which is a word that in the in Pali tradition in the words or what is unspoken, what can't be visualized or personified is Dhamma because it's ultimate reality and it's through our mindfulness, attentiveness to in the present moment that we begin to realize Dhamma is our refuge all the time, not just on retreats, but in everyday life in every situation. So the first precept is uh, to refrain from intentionally killing anything, including uh, insects and uh, other irritating creatures that come into our lives during this retreat. Try to refrain from intentionally uh, killing them not to mention killing other uh, mammals or human beings, and uh, refrain from taking what is not given to us. We're sharing accommodations, so we must be, uh, restrain ourselves if we see something that doesn't belong to us, not to take it, to leave it alone, Refrain from any kind of intent, intentional sexual activities during this time. To uh, guard our speech so that we don't, that during this retreat, uh, encourage this no, what we call noble silence, because these precepts are ways of restraining ourselves from distracting our attention to external conditions. So talking and speaking to each other when we get lonely or upset, we want to talk to somebody. So we use our ability to speak as a way of distracting uh, ourselves from unpleasant feelings. Uh, I encourage you to put away your iPhones and electronic devices during this retreat to, to determine to uh, maintain this silence in speech. We call this noble silence. Refrain from taking alcoholic or addictive drugs during this retreat. And to, uh, the, to just eat or be, uh, the meals at the designated time, uh, refrain from seeking distraction through eating or uh, seeking uh, things to to uh, eat when when you're in the daily life and to um, 
refrained from dressing up, where, and here we wear modest clothes and and uh, refrain from cosmetic uh, adornments and so forth to live a, in a very simple, humble way and to uh, sleep on, uh, not to seek distraction through sleeping or just sleeping through this retreat. So the, the, the uh, precepts about on, uh, not on luxurious, comfortable beds. So these are precepts to remind us to re, to re, to uh, respect this silence. Everybody's here to realize Dhamma for themselves, the silent Dhamma that we can't see or know through speaking or seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking. But through awareness, we begin to realize our true refuge, our true nature is Dhamma, ultimate reality, rather than what we think or believe or our fears, our passions, our emotional habits, which we tend to identify with, with this, what we, our real refuge is in silent awareness, and there is where the suffering of life in this form ceases. So the Buddha's first sermon after his enlightenment as a, as a sermon that I've used all my life as a Buddhist monk uh, called the Four Noble Truths and uh, it's very interesting to someone uh, like myself who was uh, has become a Buddhist uh, when I was mature I was brought up as a Christian um, and uh, so my conditioning is uh, an American kind of middle-class American Christian conditioning so that's how I was uh, saw myself through those perceptions white middle-class Christian uh, perceptions that are that one acquires after you're born so coming into the Buddhist world uh, was uh, was more intuitive, a sense of something missing, so something inadequate in the conditioning I had, just in 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 being a man, a, a, a racial creature, a human being, being a Christian, being American, middle class, all these identities were given to me. I didn't choose them. Your parents and your peers when you're born give you an identity. And yet that identity is given to you. It's not your natural state. So in the Buddhist teaching, when he was uh, teaching of his five colleagues after enlightenment, he pointed to the most common, ordinary human experience that we can all recognize quite easily, which is suffering. In Pali, we call it dukkha. So this was very interesting to find out, like when I encountered Buddhism, uh, when I was about 21 years old, <clears throat> I really um, became interested because it didn't demand a belief. It's not asking you to believe in anything. And uh, where in the American traditions and Christian traditions, you're very much uh, uh, compelled to believe in what you're told where in the Four Noble Truths, it's not a belief in suffering, it's an understanding of it. So I asked myself, why did the Buddha, after his enlightenment, when he'd been practicing all kinds of concentration, meditative practices with his uh, five uh, colleagues, 
when he perfected every single one of them, but still felt something missing, something not that I haven't realized, that I can't just get through concentrating the mind, but through that then he realized it was through the understanding of suffering, our human suffering, that we realize the deathless Dhamma, ultimate reality. So this is a very ancient teaching when we consider it in our perceptions of time 2,565 years ago in India. This teaching was brought forth, but it's very, it's a timeless teaching. It's not like an ancient religious teaching that may be appropriate, may have been appropriate 2,500 years ago, but it's very appropriate to life here in modern day Singapore, because it's very different today's Singapore from ancient India. And yet the human suffering is the same. It hasn't changed. We, this human state that we're experiencing through this form, the, the body, male or female bodies, as they, as they are young, as they grow old, and, and uh, we experience uh, the suffering through COVID, through illness. And so this suffering is to be understood with wisdom, not to be, it's not about getting rid of it. Because it's natural to this, this uh, realm that we're experiencing through a very sensitive form. So reflect on the fact that our forms are totally sensitive forms. What we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, feel, the, the whole physical form of a human individual is about sensitivity. So sensitivity can be pleasurable, painful, or neutral. And so our experience after birth is a, our birth uh, experience. We, we begin to experience this, the sensory uh, through the form, the infantile form. So we can feel pain and pleasure through just uh, the physical body that we're born into. And we, later on, we're told that that's what we are, is a physical form. So we limit ourselves to a very sensitive form, the human body form, and experience life through this illusion of a separate self, of a being a separate person, a, a sensitive form, as, and these forms vary. They can be, the, you know, infants are born disabled or blind or uh, in, in various ways of different, there's female forms, male forms, human forms in all their varieties and appearances, racial varieties or whatever are about sensitivity. So suffering, the first noble truth that the Buddha proclaimed in Saranat 2,565 years ago, is to be understood, not uh, to let go, to understand something, you need to let go of it. You can't understand something by just clinging to the illusions that you, you're conditioned with. So this awakening process of the Buddha is to awaken to the reality of conscious experience in the limited form that we identify as ourself. So you can see the problems in family life, in in uh, national in nations, in wars, in conflicts, in political 
quarrels and so forth are all around forms and sensitivity views and opinions which vary from one person to the next. Like we aren't the same, we don't have the same feelings at the same time or the same thoughts or the same memories. We're conditioned, uh, we, are, we have what we call karma, the, the physical inheritance of our parents, uh, and that's, those are forms that we inherit, then we're conditioned by our, our culture, by what our mother tells us, our father, our family, our society, our religion, we're all acquired knowledge. What we don't acquire, which we're born with, like a newborn infant, is a conscious form it, you, it isn't, it, it, consciousness is not given to it, it's born into consciousness. So it's natural. It's a natural, consciousness is natural. It's not a, a something that is different in, in individual human beings. It's the same for all of us. Consciousness is the same for all sentient beings then the forms are born into consciousness. So a newborn infant, before it's conditioned to see itself as a form, is fully conscious human being. And so when we talk about mindfulness or awareness, we're talking about something natural to us, not something created through uh, the ego, through, through cultural conditioning, through religious conditioning. And that's Dhamma. Dhamma is, is nature, is natural. It's not created by anybody. So when we take refuge in Dhamma, then we're taking refuge in ultimate reality or nature itself which is impersonal. It's not personal condition. The personal conditions are the body, uh, what we feel like at this moment, each one of you uh, feels a certain way emotionally, you're interested or bored, you're confused, or you're, you, you like what you hear, or you, you don't like it, or whatever reaction, emotional reaction that individuals are having at this moment are not going to be exactly the same because on the condition level we're all very different and separate. But awareness of the emotion and the form, that awareness is unitive. That is not personal. So when we talk about the anatta or no self, this awareness is, is where we realize the freedom from not being bound, limited in forms, in conditioning. We find ultimate freedom and happiness through seeing through the illusions that we've been conditioned by. So the first noble truth is to be, is to understand suffering. Then the second noble truth is to investigate the causes of suffering. Because suffering is conditioned, it's not permanent, it's not absolute. It depends on other conditions. So it's, it's a condition itself, so when we attach to conditions as ourselves, then we feel, we can feel lonely, isolated, unloved, uh, when we, uh, when we're children, when we're teenagers, when we're adults, middle-aged, 
When we get old, we, we identify with the form, with the aging process of the physical body. We identify with the gender of the body. And, and so we have problems around gender, around male, female, or all the other uh, gender identities that are prominent in, con in modern consciousness these days. These are illusory identities that we tend to attach to, and we're limited and bound by those identities. So then, that's why we suffer, because this realm that we identify with is a realm of desire. It's a desire realm, like sensory, being, having eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, having a brain. It's all about desire. Desire for happiness, desire for love, desire for beauty, desire for pleasure desire for stability, all the sensual desires, a desire to, for beauty through this scene, or, or desire to, to listen to beautiful sounds, desire for, for the pleasure of sensory experience. We call that gamma dhanha, or desire, sensual desire. And that clinging to gamma dhanha, to sensual desire is the cause of suffering. It's blind clinging. It's not like intentional clinging. It's habitual condition clinging to the, ob the, the to the senses that we experience uh, our consciousness at this moment. So sensual desire is the one form of desire. The, the second is called bhavadana, or desire to become. So there's always this desire to, to become wealthy or desire to become uh, president or prime minister, desire to become well, you know, uh, to be famous or appreciate a desire to get enlightened, desire to attain uh, spiritual states, desire for becoming, it's called. So it's a desire that we make through this ignorance, through this ignorance of, of Dhamma and not understanding the causes of suffering. Then the third form of desire is vipavadana, desire to get rid of what we don't like and don't want. So these desires, this is very important, are important to realize desire. Are you really your desires? Is that, are you just limited to the desire realm as and wanting to get something you don't have, or wanting to get rid of what you don't like. Or you can be aware of desire. So the second noble truth is all about awakening to desire, not getting rid of it. It's not about annihilating desire, but understanding it, seeing that you're not a desire. You're not a desire. So that's liberating, to realize you're not this limited creature stuck in a lifetime in a human form and having to survive in a very frightening realm. Because one of our most common human emotions is fear. Because it's, it's very frightening to feel isolated, alone, in a separate form, in a vast universe that we, you know, when we look up into the sky at the sun or at night at the moon and the stars, we recognize how vast this universe is that we perceive through seeing and where this separate little form in this vast universe. 
So we seek refuge in all kinds of distractions, entertainments, eating food, smoking, taking drugs, drinking alcohol. All these are ways of limiting our fears, our anxieties, our worries, because we don't understand where the causes of them, we, we don't understand ourselves, so we tend to seek addictive substances or just uh, habit, habitual patterns that keep our attention fixed on, uh, on what's uh, the next thing we're going to do, our next plan, our next uh, desire to be fulfilled. Or our life can be one of just resentment, of wanting to get rid of things, wanting to get rid of all the corruption, all the fear, all the foolishness, all the strife, all the misery that we see around us or we experience ourselves. We want happiness, we don't want to be unhappy. We want stability, we want to feel safe, stable, loved, appreciated, healthy. <clears throat> and yet, this very life we all have to experience loneliness, isolation, fear, sickness, and old age, and then death. So death is, uh, is, uh, is usually something most people are afraid of. Because then what we identify with is always about change and uh, kind of inexorable changingness of what we experience through our senses, through our bodies, through our experience of life is all changing. And, and we want stability, we want certainty and happiness. And so these desires for certainty, or happiness, or stability, we can observe. So when we talk about awareness and mindfulness, this is our, this is the, what we call the gate to the deathless, to the deathless Dhamma, Amata Dhamma, is through this awareness, through taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, is the ceremonial form, but its practical form is in awareness here and now. And what you're feeling or experiencing individually, you can be aware of. And not judge it. It's not about saying how you should feel at this moment or saying, you know, if you don't feel good, you should feel, feel any other way. It's just trusting in this awareness to be the puto or the witness to the experience that you're individually having at this very moment. Now this, as a practice, integrates into daily life. Because on a retreat such as this, where you've just taken the eight precepts, you know, everything is kind of organized. It's a very nice place, a beautiful temple, a uh, very uh, pleasant environment. We have air conditioning. Uh, everything is, is programmed for you. So you don't have to go shopping or, uh, you know, choose what you want to eat or, you know, uh, uh, to, to get distracted in any way. You're on noble silence, so you're, you're not talking to each other to distract each other or complaining about anything. If you feel like you're complaining, be aware of complaining as like this. you feel fear or anxiety or worry, be aware of it, rather than just trying to get rid of it or blame it on somebody else. 
So this awareness is the gate to the deathless, to realize your true nature, which is deathless. Your true nature is not the body, not the personality, not the sense objects or the senses themselves. Your true nature is ultimately perfect, it's Dhamma, and it's through realizing this for yourself. Like the Buddha never asks us to believe in anything. It's not about believing what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is encouragement to have to take refuge in awareness, mindfulness, conscious awareness, which is pure and trustworthy. And investigate the things you identify with the conditions you, you see yourself as, your thoughts, your memories, your emotional habits, your physical uh, form, your gender, your nationality, all your identities that you've been given, you become aware of as, as empty phenomena. So the basic teachings that we always refer to in this tradition is, in Pali we chant Sape Anich, Sape Sankara Anicca, which translates all conditions are impermanent. This word anicca in Pali is translated into English as impermanent. So that means everything that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, every word we think, every thought, every emotion, the physical body itself, the senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the brain, all these are subject to change and they're impermanent. They, they have a beginning and an end. But that which is aware, awareness, is not impermanent. So in awareness, we take our refuge in awareness, conscious awareness, <clears throat> that's Dhamma. That's natural, <clears throat> that's ultimate reality. It's here and now. And as you begin to trust yourself to investigate what you identify with, your habits, your forms, without judging them. It's not about making personal judgments about your habits as being good or bad, right or wrong. It's about witnessing them. They are what they are. We all have good habits or we all have bad habits and these things depend on other conditions to manifest. The senses themselves, as you grow older, you know, your eyes, your vision diminishes, your hearing diminishes. Like right now at my age, I can't see very well. My, I used to have perfect vision as when I was young, and now it's, it's a very imperfect, and I can't hear very well, can't walk very well. This is the, the nature of the body. When you're 88 years old, it gets like this. At least this body is like this. Is it suffering to have an old body? People ask me if I suffer because of the limitations I find myself with. And then, you know, because I spent so many years observing suffering and the causes of suffering, then I can see that, that mindfulness isn't suffering. What I truly am, this awareness, never suffers. 
But if I grasp the aging process of the body or the limitations that I, that I personally don't want, then I start suffering. So the personality suffers because it, you know, who wants to get old and get sick or weak or lose your vision or hearing or uh, get disabled in various ways that old age tends to bring to us. Nobody wants that. So personally, the personality, the ego, doesn't, doesn't want to get old, wants to be healthy, vigorous, with perfect vision, hearing, like I, I remember when I was young. That's the personality. But that personality is a creation. So we, let, we begin to see through our personality into letting go of it, not getting, you don't get rid of your personality, but you no longer cling to it. And your real refuge is in conscious awareness, sati, sampatanya in Pali, that means mindfulness and understanding, clear comprehension. Sat Sati Sampatanya, conscious awareness, that's the refuge where you realize non-suffering is, is here and now. It's ultimate freedom from delusion, from bondage, from the limitations of the bodies that we have, from the fears, uh, that we experience through this realm, this changing realm where we can't control it. We have to learn to live in the, in the society we're born into and how it changes, affects us, our parents, our family, our husbands, wives, partners, all are in this inexorable changing state. So we suffer when it changes the way we don't want it, if we're attached to it. But when we let go of this realm, it's not about annihilating or getting rid of it. It's not about getting rid of, your, uh, of everything around you. But letting go of it means you, you're no longer identifying with the limitations of what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or think. So through this, these Four Noble Truths, the Third Noble Truth is the, the realization, your true realization is called Neroda, that's the end of suffering which is when you really understand suffering and its causes through wisdom, not through just uh, definitions of it. It's not through in the intellect that we understand, it's through intuitive awareness, trusting in awareness that we find our strength through trusting in awareness then we can deal with life as we have to experience it in its various forms. So this talk this morning is, is an encouragement. It's not a demand or a doctrine. And this is very much in the theme of Buddhism because uh, in the, the, the fundamental teaching of the Lord Buddha is, uh, is an encouragement to investigate life. Like the Four Noble Truths are not beliefs. We don't believe in suffering. 
it's not asking you to believe in suffering or that life is all suffering and it's not a negative nihilistic teaching it's to understand it's about understanding suffering because that's our common experiences as human beings whether it was in ancient India or modern Singapore the suffering is pretty much the same so on this retreat see it's not you're not here to get rid of suffering but to understand it and to understand it we don't blame others for it like usually when we suffer we blame somebody else or the weather you know so like in uh, when I was a newly ordained monk in Thailand they had uh, you know in Wat Bapong in Ubon northeast Thailand the Wat Bapong at that time Lung Po Cha's monastery it was very undeveloped with a lot of mosquitoes and uh, And of course, uh, we can't kill anything. Where as a layman, I had no compunction, no, no fist, no, no resistance to killing mosquitoes. I thought that was a good thing to do. Became a monk, then I'm not supposed to kill them. And then living in a place where there's mosquitoes all the time and you don't want them. So this, and then Lung Po Cha's emphasis on mindfulness, to be mindful of, of this aversion, not wanting something you don't like. So the mosquitoes were teaching me, changed my attitude towards them, because I didn't want them, I didn't like them, and they're unlikable, they're not lovable, they're not cute, they're just incredibly annoying and unpleasant and, and sting you. So naturally, the human personality wants to get rid of them. Now this, this sense of wanting to get rid of them, I became aware of was something I created. Probably mosquitoes existed before human beings did. And then I'm an American coming to live in Thailand and saying I don't like mosquitoes, I don't want them, blaming Thailand and the mosquitoes for my suffering was like this. I could see that just to, to blame suffering on mosquitoes was, was uh, a form of, of selfish intention, habit, a, a, a kind of habit pattern of not wanting something I disliked or feared or didn't want. Being aware of that fear of that dislike rather than trying to get rid of it. At first I used to try to they have metta for mosquitoes. I thought that's the way to deal with it. So I used to spread what I call loving kindness to mosquitoes. But I didn't really feel loving kindness towards them. It was merely intellectual. And uh, I was told that's, that's a good thing to do because they're living creatures. So just intellectually spreading metta to mosquitoes, you know, was, was one thing, but it didn't, create, it didn't stop the aversion and, and frustration when there were mosquitoes around. So then, going deeper than just intellectually spreading metta to them, saying I had to 
love them as a person, you can't love mosquitoes. Personalities don't, you know, are different, but they can, they're unlovable. But you can feel compassion, understanding. The form of a mosquito is, is a sensory form. It's in this realm, this fear realm, it has to survive. You understand that? And then I thought the mosquitoes were long, were in Thailand long before I ever came. And uh, who am I to say, you know, that they shouldn't be here? Through thinking like that, through uh, investigating my aversion to, to not wanting something, I began to see that the awareness itself isn't about not wanting. Not wanting is a, is a condition that arises under other conditions that present themselves. So what am I? Am I the conditioned person, the monk who wants to love mosquitoes or spread metta to them or feels he should do so? Or am I the awareness you know, these are questions to ask yourself. What is your true nature? Your stable, true, trustworthy nature at this very moment. It can't be emotional. Emotions change according to other situations. Emotions go all over the place. Whether it's hot and sunny or cold and wet, whether somebody criticizes you, you feel a certain way. Somebody praises you, you feel a certain way. Emotions are very unstable. To find emotional stability is impossible because life presents us with so many uh, changing conditions that emotions are subject to. But what is stable during all emotional experience is awareness of them. I will be here only, uh, what's it agreed on in the morning? 10 to 11 slot. And I, I'm inviting uh, Venerable Asoko and Venerable Renita to uh, guide the rest of the retreat when I'm not here. And um, because being old, I have, uh, I get tired very quickly, though I would like to be here and sit with you, walk with you during this retreat, but I find at my age that I really can't uh, do this anymore. In this retreat here in Singapore, I, I was supposed to give it long before this, but then the COVID pandemic occurred and um, it seemed impossible to come to Singapore and at that time. I left Thailand and returned to live in England. And so, uh, and then this past year, I determined to spend one rainy season retreat, one Vasa retreat in, in uh, the United States, because I've never actually spent uh, much time in the United States since I ordained. Also, I wanted to visit my 90-year-old sister, and uh, she was uh, being very, she was losing her memory, getting very frail, so I determined last year to, to travel to North America, which I did with Ajahn Nasoko. 
And uh, so I've been traveling to spend time in, my sister lived in Vancouver, Washington, Washington State near Portland, Oregon. And she passed away while I was, not when I was there with her, but after I left. So I went to her funeral, I had to go back to Vancouver, Washington to attend her funeral. And uh, so I think she was just waiting for me to arrive. And, and so I, because she died soon after I left. So then we spent time in a Baigiri in California. We went to stay with Ajahn Virdamo in Canada. And then we spent the Pansa or the Vasa, as uh, they say in Pali, the, the three months retreat in uh, New Hampshire, a monastery, uh, branch monastery in uh, Temple, New Hampshire. And then coming back to England afterward, we came, I was invited to attend a ceremony in Thailand of Wat Bananachat. They built this very beautiful Uposita Hall. And the abbot of Wat Bananachat, Ajahn Kavli, <coughs> Kavli, invited me to attend since I was the founder of that monastery 40 years ago or so. And um, so it's a very impressive, the king and queen of Thailand came to this event and it was very, uh, very uh, beautiful ceremony. So I attended that and then traveled to various other places in Thailand, then to Bangkok, and then to Singapore. So at the end of this retreat, I returned to uh, England, where I hope to settle down for a while. And uh, when you get old, you, uh, you, you like the you, you find uh, changing conditions more kind of confusing. So it's, um, I was very, very honored to the uh, abbot of this monastery, Kuang Sheng, built this meditation center in order to provide occasions for Singaporeans to, to practice and to investigate Dhamma. So this word investigate is very important. It's, it's like an invitation. The Buddha encourages us to investigate life. And it takes a kind of courage to investigate life and a willingness to to look at things we don't like and to to observe without without judging life anymore, but using our refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha as our abiding witnessing position to what we have to experience through these separate forms. Through these separate forms experience life in so many different ways. One reason why we have conflicts and misunderstandings is because we don't understand each other. We don't understand ourselves. Uh, we think that you, you know, uh, that you should think what I think. You should feel what I feel. You should understand what the way I understand. So this is a conceit that we're oftentimes conditioned with our personalities and learning to, like in marriage, can be a problem because we don't understand each other. We think you should believe what I say or understand 
me because you should be like me. Being a, a, head, a senior monk in a sangha, being an abbot of a monastery, you've got to deal with so many different personalities. And the mistakes I made early on in, in these positions was to think that, that everybody should think like me or be like me, which was a, a, an illusion I began to see through. And then to realize that we can't help the way we are. We may not even like the way we are, but it's not something about liking or disliking, approving or disapproving, but understanding. We learn from the karma that we're experiencing, whatever it might be, whichever way it goes. So it's a way of understanding yourself, understanding life itself, understanding others, in which you begin to, to feel this sense of compassion, of real metta, of loving kindness towards all beings, not just an intellectual uh, understanding of loving kindness, but the real, the real thing itself. Unconditioned love, compassion, joy, mudita, joy, and equanimity. So these what we call the four Brahma Viharas manifest through understanding, through enlightened understanding of our true nature. So I offer this as a reflection for this morning.